of the women listening are probably familiar with you and your work, but Iris is a love and dating coach and a licensed psychotherapist. And I believe that our topic today is going to be really important and really relevant. We're going to be talking about how to pick an emotionally mature and evolved man. And I know there are women out there that are just going, yes, how to pick an emotionally mature and evolved man. So first of all, Iris, to jump right in, tell me why you decided to pick this topic and why you felt like you wanted to talk to us about this today. Yeah, so when I'm working with my clients, there's two areas that I focus on is the inner work for their own stuff that they need to clear so that they're not reactive, they get that they deserve love, they have a high enough standard. Then on the flip side is how do they function out there in the dating world to pick the right man? Who do they lay in? Who do they keep out? Who do they give a second chance? And when you don't know the signs of an emotionally available man, especially when you've had a childhood that was traumatic or parents weren't responsive, you have a normal that isn't necessarily gonna give you a healthy man. So this is a way of starting to look at what, what's out there and what's dating. You might know what you don't like, but you need to start to know what the markers are of what it is that you are looking for. Mm -hmm. Yes, very well said. So what are some of the things that we should be looking for? What are some of the things that you see women bumping up against in this area? Help us, help enlighten us. Yeah, so first we're going to start is what is an evolved man, a mature man, a conscious man? So it's a man who can take responsibility for his own stuff. And it's a man that is willing and capable to show up for you in the way that you need him. Now, it doesn't mean that he's contorting himself or dismissing his own needs. It means that you're picking a man who, first of all, is in alignment with what you're looking for and a man who wants to show up to create safety and connection in the relationship. So what does that look like? So we want someone who shows up in a way that has us feel like, okay, I can relax. I don't need to always be on guard for, you know, is he going to respond to me? Is he going to ask me out? Is he looking at that cute waitress that went by in the <laughs> short skirt, right? Or making a comment about people. It's like, oh, she really shouldn't be wearing that. So you want to just start to see how he shows up with other people. Is he dismissive? Is he too flirty? The flirtiness introduces threat in the relationship it means like i'm not on a date with you but my eyes are over there and that's not what you want you want to know that when you're out there dating and in relationship you're the number one priority so i'm going to ask our viewers to really pay attention to see how does that sit with you that you're the number one priority does it feel uncomfortable? Does it make you feel vulnerable because there's too much attention being paid? Or is like, absolutely, I should be number one. So you wanna see where you are in that continuum. And maybe those are some of the things that you may wanna to continue to do some work on. It is how do I feel about me that I should deserve a great man who honors, loves, adores, and respects me? Mm-hmm. Well, and I think this is so important because I think for a lot of women, whether we recognize it or not, and sometimes this is more on a subconscious level than on a conscious level, we don't necessarily feel like we're worthy or deserving of having that kind of attention, of that kind of love, of being someone's priority in that way that would allow us to relax and feel safe. Totally. And, and really, if you're willing to look look back at your history and your childhood, how did your parents treat you? I love to talk about attachment styles or what I call your relationship blueprints. So what was it that you learned in childhood that was imprinted on you that this is what I can expect in life? This is how people show up. This is how much I can trust the world. So if you've had trauma, if you've had any kind of abuse in your childhood, or even if you've been neglected, you have a, let's say a square that you live in, that this is how people are. And that's what you recreate in your adulthood because that's all you know. So if you've had a dad or a mom who are emotionally unavailable, couldn't respond to your needs, you have a high tolerance for immature behavior, for a man who isn't able to show up for you in a way that makes you feel safe, that makes you feel honored and cherished. So you wanna to start to look first at 
what is it that I am bringing forward into the dating world that makes me allow that that allows me to let a man enter my world that doesn't treat me the way I truly want to be treated. All of us know how we want to be treated. Right. But we put up with stuff because we've learned to tolerate it in our childhood and we tolerate it in our adulthood, but we can change that. Well, not only do we tolerate it, it becomes familiar and on some level what we expect or what we're comfortable with because we have that's what we're used to that's how we're used to feeling right yeah and i'm going to say that we often pick a partner that triggers us not because we're masochistic but because it's an opportunity for us to heal the wounds we have from childhood it doesn't have to be big wounds but it could be the ways in which you were disappointed or hurt and when you pick a conscious evolved man the two of you actually get to heal that stuff from the past to create a new future when you pick a partner and it could be male or female whatever your orientation is because this just applies to human when you pick a partner that isn't able to step up to give you what you need when you're struggling that may dismiss you that may ridicule you all it does is it recreates your childhood and it's kind of like having an open wound that keeps getting cut open every time so it never gets to heal so that's the opportunity in picking a conscious man who's willing to step up and say you know i'm sorry you're struggling with this sweetie could you use a hug even if he doesn't agree with you. Mm, mm -hmm, yeah. Well, and another thing that you said right at the beginning of this conversation that I want to swing back around to, Iris, because I think it's so important to put some emphasis here, is you said he's responsible for his own stuff. And I think this also pulls us out of that temptation to gravitate towards someone who we feel might need rescuing or, you know, that's another pattern. We can we can pick kind of the fixer uppers, um, you know, and think, oh, I can change him or he needs me. I can help him. You know, the savior complex kind of thing. That's another pattern. And I know yeah. that was a pattern for a while for me. I grew up. Did, oh, you're relating. Huh? Yes. Yeah. So I grew up with the oldest of six children. And my mom went through a period of very, very significant depression during my childhood. And so a lot of the responsibility for caring for these younger siblings fell on my shoulders and I didn't do a very good job of it because I was 10, 11 or 12. And so she would, uh, you know, she was going through a very hard time and she would like take out the anger that I wasn't picking up the pieces on me. And so I kind of got into this pattern where I felt like I was like the caretaker for the whole world for a period of time. And I would gravitate towards these kind of men that needed a lot of support and needed a lot of help. And boy, was I there with them. Yeah, and I can totally relate to that because I did over a decade of that, of picking projects. I mean, <laughs> on top of childhood, I figured I'm a therapist. I'm a couples counselor. I have the skills to make a relationship work. I can make a difference. But what I forgot is that it takes two people. Yes. Right. And, and that's where we get into a trouble is when our partner isn't willing to meet us to grow together, to co-create the kind of relationship together. And so you want to start to have a look at yourself. What is it you learned in childhood? And maybe what are you compensating for? Right. What are some of the skills that are overdeveloped, like being strong, being independent, making things happen? I mean, I know that for you, Michelle, that fits really well. It fits for me as well. But there's a shadow side to that. When we become right. overly responsible for someone else, it really messes up a relationship of, of equals and allows us to pick someone who doesn't do their work and we're responsible for the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And what I even found, Iris, you may have found this too, is instead of these men being so grateful for all of my wonderful help, <laughs> they started to resent it right? Like it made them feel like, well, what? She doesn't think that I can handle it on my own. And in fact, in some cases they couldn't, but they still started to resent that I was showing up that way when I thought I was just being so incredibly giving and caring and supportive. Yeah. And on top of that, when I needed support, they couldn't show up for me. Right. You know, 
I'll give you a quick example. I was dating this one guy, Alan, and I knew not to say anything to him, but he called me in the morning and I still shared it with him. I said I had a nightmare last night. I had a nightmare that something happened to my daughter who was already an adult. And I started to get teary and he got so mad at me. Dreams don't mean anything. I took a course in dreams and I thought, like, why do you take a course in dreams if it doesn't mean anything? And he says, when you get that through your head, call me back. And he hung up on me. Whoa. So emotionally, he couldn't show up for me in the way that I needed, probably from his own childhood. Nobody allowed him to have his emotions and he couldn't deal with that level of emotion. So he shut it down. Now, did it feel horrible? Of course. Now, I also get where he's coming from, but that also ended our relationship. <laughs> Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what we're talking about is you are observing, part of this is we're observing how someone shows up over a period of time. I mean, that's a, a pretty dramatic example of how he's not able to show up. But I think we really observe how a man is able to show up over a period of time. And if he is taking responsibility for his own life and doing his own work, and we don't have to like be responsible, as you said, for everything. <laughs> yeah, he got triggered and he chose to blame me for him getting triggered. He didn't want to hear it. And I always tell women, you're the buyers. You're auditioning a man for the main part in your play. It's like when we go grocery shopping, we look at all the cartons of milk. There is the skim, the 2% homogenized, there's lactose-free, then there's almond milk. And you choose which one you're going to invest in based on two things. Which one is not toxic for me? So if you're lactose intolerant, you're not going to buy the regular milk. You're going to go for the lactose free or the almond milk, but also what's the shelf life on that product? It's the same thing with relationship. What's the shelf life in this relationship? Can it last long term because I feel safe and he shows up for me in moments where our needs may conflict or we don't have agreement or I'm really struggling. And I'll just give you a quick example that the man that I'm living with and I'm sharing my life with, we went on our first week, we went on six dates. Three of them were just what we would call normal dates. The other three, we alternated, we went running because I was training for a triathlon. I was really struggling with my speed. I just couldn't get any faster. He's a running coach. So we went running at the end of the run. I just started to get teary and I'm trying to hold the tears in, but I can't, couldn't go any faster. And he, all he did was open up his arms. I went into his arms and he just held me. He didn't have to say anything. He was able to show up for me in a way, whether he agreed with me or not that had me feel safe, heard, taken care of. It didn't take a lot, it took 10 seconds, my tears were gone. That's what's available when you pick a man who can be responsive to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lovely, lovely example of what we're talking about. And I think it's what most women long for. I think one of the blocks to this is that for many of us, you know, I was single until I was 43. I've now been married to my husband for 14 years, but I had a very long and winding journey to love. I, I was the first time bride at 43. And believe me, boy, did I take a tour through all the wrong relationships. A lot of speed bumps and potholes along the journey. And um, one of the things that I think um, is really important for us to always, always remember is that exactly what you were saying we are the ones that get to make a choice i think sometimes we get in this mode where we're so busy thinking does he like me is he going to choose me am i his type you know especially if it's been a long time and and someone's paying attention it's like women sometimes start feeling like we're the ones that have to like please them or do they like me instead of us like you said looking at the, the i like the milk analogy looking at, is this the right match for me? Is this someone that I can feel comfortable with? Is this someone that the expiration date is not gonna to expire tomorrow on if you're looking for that long-term relationship? And not, uh, I always feel like there's a lot of wisdom in taking a bit of time on the front end of things, even if there's a lot of chemistry, even if it feels, feels really exciting to evaluate some of those things. Yeah, and I can tell you that while I was out there dating, somebody would be interested in me. It's like, oh, great, let me see what I can do to make this work rather than to assess, does he fit my needs and my values? 
And my partner said something brilliant early on when we were dating. And he said, when you don't know what you're looking for, anyone will do. And so it's really critical that you get clear on what it is that you need to make you feel safe, that's in alignment with the kind of life you want to live, the kind of emotional connection that you want. And you start to process and filter the men through those filters. Because I always say dating's not a numbers game. That's a recipe for exhaustion. Mm -hmm. Only about 10% of men out there are match for you. So you need to get really good at filtering men so that you're not wasting your time on men that don't have a shelf life. Like I would rather be home reading a book than going on a date that goes nowhere. Right, right, absolutely. Well, and I always tell women a big part of being with the right man or meeting and finding the right man is not being gangled up with the wrong man. And the wrong man can still be a nice guy. That's a, this is where it gets a little tricky and a little nuanced. He can still be the right guy, but if he's not available for you, if he's not available to be in partnership with you in the way that you want to have, or he's not emotionally available to show up for you in some of these key ways, he can still be the wrong guy, even though he might have a lot of really nice qualities and characteristics. Yeah, I'll give you a really easy, superficial example that really doesn't have to do with character, which is what we're looking for. But when I went out on a date with a man that liked to travel in North America, I've been to 58 countries. I love going to countries all over the world, and I even love to put on a backpack and travel that way. I needed a man that was in alignment with that kind of life and lifestyle, what my partner calls, we're both world curious. And so I chose not to keep dating him because that little thing is a big thing in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that's that doesn't sound superficial to me. That sounds like a core value. That's a value for you because it's not just about the traveling. It's about who you are. It's about you, your vision of seeing the world and understanding people and cultures. I mean, I'm guessing it has a lot more to do with just getting on. It has a lot more substance to it than just getting on a plane and wanting to go on these fancy trips. It's a, it's a value for you. So that doesn't sound superficial to me at all. It sounds like a, an important value. And I think you started with, we have to know things about ourselves. You know, you started about talking about how we have to know some things about ourselves and we have to do our own inner work. And one of the things that I think is important in terms of our inner work is understanding what some of our core values are and what some of our lifestyle choices are and how someone would, you know, how we would mesh together. Like I think there's you and there's him and then there's the two of you together. And how, what's this combination going to look like? What the, What's this combination going to be? Yeah. And what am I willing to live on my own? And I've got some women who are willing to travel on their own, and that's fine. It's not a good or bad, but what am I willing to do? But I knew that I wanted to share this part with my partner. It's a critical piece for the kind of life I wanted to live. And also, what's non-negotiable that you have to experience with your partner? You want someone in alignment because it's going to create that kind of quality in your life so that you're not compromising or suppressing just to get off, you know, many, many of us. And I remember I was there. I just wanted to get off that singles treadmill. Let me find that one. And then finally, I'll be in a relationship and I'll never have to go on a first date. But it was a setup for me to go on in a whole bunch of unhealthy relationships that ended up in heartbreak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I want to ask you one more question, and that is, in addition to like observing how someone's showing up over a period of time, which we've talked about a little bit, what are some other things that you recommend that women really pay attention to that we may not have mentioned already that can give them insight as to whether or not they're potentially getting involved with an emotionally available and evolved man? Here's a great question that I teach the women that I coach to use. Ask a man what he learned from his past relationships. Mm -hmm. Does he blame and criticize and say all the women he's dated are crazy? I guarantee you, you'll be the next one. What's his relationship with his family? Ask him, you know, I'm just curious. I've been thinking a lot about my own childhood. What was your childhood like when you were growing up? 
Now, it doesn't mean that that's the end of it, just because he had this kind of childhood, but you just want to see how much he's self-reflective, how much he's grown. Does he believe in personal growth? That was part of my online profile, is that I, I said, because I was in, in personal growth, I was looking for a man that was open to it. And my partner is a recruiter. So he said, I'm not exactly in personal growth, but I live next door to it and I'd be open to it. So <laughs> that's what I needed. You need to explore what is their perspective on life? What is their view on sharing time with family? What's yours? Does it fit? Are you looking to create, are you, know, are you looking for the same outcome? Are you looking to have children, create a family? Where are you in the same stage? Are you looking towards retirement? Are you looking for whatever your needs are? You want to make sure that they're in alignment because otherwise it's just a life of power struggle in the end. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think sometimes we're like almost afraid to ask, ask some of these questions or we can be. Um, but I feel like this is definitely a case where the truth sets you free. And I also find that a lot of men are actually quite really forthcoming when you're asking questions like this, that a lot of them will really share a lot about themselves. So you can really get some great insights into who this person is. My only caution would be always be prepared to answer the question you've just asked, because I'll often say, what about you? You don't want to get caught off guard without an answer and feel like you can't answer it. If you want a man to answer those questions, you need to be prepared with your own answer as well. Very good point. Absolutely true. <laughs> so Iris, this has been so much fun to connect with you and to talk about this topic. Thank you, Michelle. This has been great. Thank you for this conversation. Yeah, I've enjoyed it too. And thank you everyone for joining us. We commend you for being committed to your own growth and for creating possibility in your own lives and hope that these interviews is empowering to you. And we look forward to seeing you for more. Bye-bye for now. Bye.